I once heard someone say that a tree without roots is just another piece of wood. I guess that's probably true. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. In today's show, I wanted to explore what I consider to be the most important aspect of plants and really people for that matter, and that's their roots. I feel the same can be said of people. It's because of our roots that we remain grounded and centered and take in the world. Our roots form who we are underneath the surface. So why don't we begin our journey at Queen Wilhelmina State Park, where history means so much. The Queen Wilhelmina Lodge, it's perched up on Rich Mountain, Arkansas's second highest peak. Built to entice railroad passengers in the 1890s, the original structure cost a whopping $100,000 to build, and I'm sure a glorious sight to see for weary passengers. Dutch investors named the inn in honor of Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands and kept a reserved suite of rooms for her and hoped she would visit, of which she never did. How does this idea of Queen Wilhelmina, a Dutch queen, play into the name of a park and a lodge? Because that seems so odd out here in western Arkansas. Back in the 1800s, a man by the name of Arthur Stilwell decided he was going to build a railroad south. He started in Kansas City, and when he got to 200 and some miles, he ran out of funding. And oh. there was a depression in the late 1800s, sure. and there was nobody that would fund him. So he remembered some friends over in Holland and said, I'm going to look them up. And he told his friends here in America, he says, I'm going to get $3 million from those investors. He went to Holland and he got that $3 million and was able <laughs> to bring it into Mina. And he's the one who decided to name this Queen Wilhelmina Lodge well, as a destination? It, in honor. The New Netherlands Queen was Queen Wilhelmina. And in honor of her and to get publicity and, you know, <laughs> make everybody excited about the place. Yeah, they sure. named it Wilhelmina Inn. The lodge has been through several transformations through the years, but after an extensive renovation, reopened its doors to the public in July of 2015. Queen Wilhelmina Lodge offers a dramatic mountaintop setting and is within walking distance of several hiking trails and family-oriented activities. We have interpretive programs, naturalism programs, that help the park visitor learn about the mountain, about our history, sure. about our butterflies, local the ecology. Bear. Yes. Wonderful. Um, you also have the miniature train. It's about a mile ride around the top of the mountain. I bet the kids go crazy over it. Yes, but you know what? Most of the riders are adults. I had a grandfather tell me, he said he was third generation coming up here, and his grandfather had taken him. He was there with his grandkid and his great grandkid. Oh, isn't that great? A legacy trip. Yes. And a le legacy destination. Coming up, growing and cooking a delicious southern staple. These things have such wonderful flavor. And later, how do you like these apples? As a southern boy, there are certain things that my garden would feel incomplete without. Tomatoes, okra certainly, peppers, and of course, collard greens. Can you guess the name of this plant here in the vegetable garden? That's a little clue. Well, it's actually one of my favorite greens, but oddly, we're talking about the flowers. These are bulldog collards. And let me tell you, you can tell I'm from the South, and that means I love collard greens. This particular variety of collard is delicious and a vigorous grower. If you look at the big leaves they produce, they have a white vein through them. These things have such wonderful flavor, just sauteed. I even use them in slaws and salads, and you can cook them the old-fashioned way with a little bit of ham in there. That's pretty good, too. What I love about Bulldog is that it's a real bulldog in the garden. It can take cold temperatures, so this block of collards I ate on all through the late fall, through the winter, and early spring, and now I've allowed the plants to bolt, hence all of these beautiful flowers. But the eating doesn't stop with the leaves. These buds and flowers are delicious and beautiful on salads. And if you look closely, you'll find that my honeybees are enjoying them as well. 
So the way I see it, the Bulldog Collard fits into the ecosystem of my organic vegetable garden. If you haven't tried these collards, you need to give them a try. Like my dad used to say, man, they taste so good they'd make a bulldog break his chain. After the break, how about growing some of your own apples? You won't want to miss this. Apple trees are a real joy to have around, but they can be a little tricky to grow. Luckily, my friend Dr. Arlie Powell stopped by to give us some tips on how to get the young trees positioned just right for success in the orchard. Harley, I can't tell you how excited I am that you're here and you brought the trees. Absolutely. So today we're going to be planting some apples and pears. Yes, we are. And we've got some uh, excellent examples right here of what you want to plant. This is a two-year uh, tree. We also have some one-year trees. These are feathered out, as we call it, with branches. That's ideal. So Arlie, the difference between this tree and that tree, the one-year-old and this is a two-year-old, is, is just one year. Look how it's grown. One year makes a big difference. It does. These things will double in size each year, essentially. And this one, after it grows this season, is going to be producing apples for you. What could someone uh, expect out of, a, out of a couple of apple trees or a pear tree in their, in their backyard? If they're on a dwarf or semi-dwarfing rootstock, which gives you a smaller size tree, a lot easier for gardeners to manage. Yeah. Yeah. You're looking at anywhere from 50 to 200 pounds per tree. Jason, I'm so excited about getting this orchard replanted and we're starting here with this young gala apple. Absolutely. So what, what do you recommend as an orchardist? I have a soil similar to you. I've got a, a pretty heavy clay right. soil, which doesn't drain terribly well. And so I like the fact that you've got this brilliant compost that we can been, uh, mix in. Depth of planting is a second point. I'm, I'm afraid we've been guilty too often of planting too deep. You know, planting them too deeply is a problem. I've killed a lot of trees that way. See, I, and you have to allow for settling. Now what we've done here is we took the soil out of the hole, but we mixed 50-50 uh, our homemade compost and the, and the existing soil. And at this point, I usually come in and I can use the opposite side of the shovel and kind of tamp down around it and we'll come back after tamping this, add some more soil and then we can water it in deep. Yeah, and the water will really help get those air pockets out. I want to always maintain this level from the top of the pot. Yes. I don't want to get any soil up there. We're going to mulch it later. Uh, just to help keep moisture That's in right. around the little tree. Now, when do you fertilize, Jason? What do you, what, what do you, what's your technique? Uh, once the tree is bearing fruit, mid-season. But with a young tree like this, you really want to make growth. Yeah, I'm not trying to produce any fruit <laughs> on this little guy. So we can fertilize a little bit heavier. So we'll look at going in once a month. Alan, do you have rabbits or deer? We do, and um, you know, that's uh, why I got this cage uh, where we could protect the little guy. You wonder if they know that you're planting. You I know, think they're, they're watching right now. 
<laughs> so I just connect these little tines. I okay. just close the little tines like that. And then that and whole it, trunk and stem is, uh, is protected. protected. Yep. Of course, the next thing I want to do is I want to stabilize this. That's yeah. why I have these posts out here mm -hmm. uh, because I don't want this tree to knock around. I want it to root in. And by having this, this tube, I like this clear plastic tube. Uh, we can put it here on the side and that'll keep this little guy from getting knocked around. I like that. That's all you need there. Yeah, I like that. So now one last thing, what I would tend to do, um, Jason, is I would bring this soil on around and kind of create a little bit of a mound or Absolutely, a berm. Absolutely, yes. And as the water comes down yeah. uh, naturally, it would kind of puddle around the tree and I could capture water. And in the summer, that would be good because and, we've got irrigation out here, but I like catching that natural rainwater. I agree. You know as well as I do, those trees know the difference between rainwater and, and hose water. And because you're on a slope, I like your idea of berming it up higher on yeah, this, on this side. side, right, to catch it. And then put some mulch around. Absolutely. Yeah, very good. Well, I think we're off to a good start with these trees. I do too. I really appreciate your help. It, my pleasure. Always great to have you here. Thank you, Alan. Next, why spend money on the expensive stuff when you can make your own lip gloss at home? Can you believe a man invented lip gloss? An inventor by the name of Max Factor created this product in the 1930s for the movie industry. It was developed specifically for actresses starring in black and white film. So who's ready to be a star? With your very own organic lip gloss. To make this lip gloss, what you need is a small mason jar and a hot water bath simmering in a small saucepan on the stove. Then in the mason jar, you're gonna put two teaspoons of beeswax pastilles, or you can take a grated block of beeswax and do it that way. Then you're gonna add one teaspoon of shea butter, three teaspoons of coconut oil. Then from there, I always like to add a little bit of the scent. So this time I use some peppermint essential oil, but you could also use lavender or orange blossom is wonderful, patchouli. It's your chance to be creative. Sometimes I like to do a little bit of everything and have a whole variety of lip gloss. So then from there, you're gonna put that mason jar into the hot water bath and let it simmer slowly until it all melts. So once it's melted, we're gonna remove it from the heat. Now be careful, make sure you use something to remove it with so you don't burn your hands. Then take it and put it on your cutting board and use a funnel. Place that funnel in one of your lip balm tubes and then slowly pour in that liquid. Make sure you get all the way to the top and then let them cool. They're gonna cool really quickly. After your lip balm is cooled and set, it's ready to use. So now go ahead and try it and make every day a red carpet affair. Coming up next, so many of us love fresh figs. Let's take a look at multiplying and sharing. Sometimes the best way to explore your roots is just to create some new ones, like using shoots from our grand old Miss Big Fig at the farm to create more fig trees. If you know me, you know I'm interested in conserving and preserving things. Well, take for instance this activity that I'm underway with today. It's all about perpetuating Miss Big Fig, a very old Celeste fig, probably close to 100 years old. Now, you can see the big old trunks in here, and after a while they begin to decay, and once they begin to decay, we remove them. But then what happens is you get all these young shoots. Here's where the opportunity comes along. By taking these shoots and clipping them in late winter, I can root each one of these and create a new Miss Big Fig. And what I want to do is I want to cut one of these low uh, stems that's close to the ground here and just show you what I mean because uh, they're already putting out what are called little aerial roots. 
If you look closely here, you can see, look at those little roots coming out on the side. Now this was a stem that was very close to the ground. The potential for these roots lies all along the stem. So all of these stems can produce new fig plants. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut these in lengths of about uh, 10 inches, and we're gonna stick them in a moist, very loose soil. And in about six weeks, you'll see lots of little roots coming out of here. Now, there are a few things I want you to keep in mind if you decide to do this at home. Number one, you want to create a container and fill it with a moist soil. The second thing you wanna do is you wanna use a rooting powder or a rooting hormone or rooting compound. You just dip the ends of the stems in it and then put them into the ground. It's that easy. And the third thing is place your container where you're rooting your figs in a place that's shady, not in direct sun, because too much sunlight will stress them out. And before long, you'll have more fig plants than you can count. Getting back to your roots can take many forms. Like planting a garden, doing something the old fashioned way, just reflecting on the past. So the next time you're feeling a little nostalgic or old school, let the past inspire you to get creative and do something new. You'll find you really enjoyed it. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and our online store.